What's up guys, Doom Lake here, welcome back to another video on the channel. As you can see, we're going to be doing something a little bit different today. So, the SCG Con is happening this week, and I believe it's it might actually be happening right now. I don't know if the event started at 11 a.m. or 12 p.m. Eastern, but it is one of the most high-profile tournaments that has occurred since the beginning of the pandemic. Now, it is split format, standard and modern, with some of the highest profile players that are you know qualified via arena via previous qualifications things like that uh, it is split format modern standard we're not going to be going over standard because I'll be quite frank with you I know nothing about standard I've heard that people say that mono green and blue red is the best deck so people are probably just going to play those two decks but what I am going to be going over with you today is my bold predictions maybe not maybe not so bold but my predictions on what the metagame is going to look like for this particular tournament now, there's, uh, you know, a lot of factors that we have to consider here. People maybe haven't played Paper Magic in two plus years since the beginning of the pandemic. So card availability, people might not have all the MH2 cards like Solitude and Ragavan and all these cards that are just keep skyrocketing in price. Um, now, I don't know if that's necessarily going to factor into what I believe is the metagame is going to look like. I'm kind of just going to give you what I perceive will be the decks that people will play um, based on a number of different factors. So uh, let's go ahead and get started then, shall we? All right, so the first deck that we have here coming in at number one, which I believe will be the highest represented. My percentage might be a little bit off the 8 to 10% because I'll be honest with you, I'm not really sure. Given how diverse modern is, I'm not really sure that any deck is even going to crack 10%. But I do believe that Burn will be the most played deck, and there's a couple of reasons. One, it's pretty easy to play. You know, I, I think, again, there's a lot of people who uh, suggest that Burn is more difficult to play at the very top percentile, and I do agree with that. The one thing that I will say about Burn is even if you're not playing at the very, very top percentile and you're not squeezing out as much of the wins as you maybe could possibly get, it's a pretty forgiving deck. You know when when all things is when all things are considered, so I think that is definitely um, something that you want to consider. I also think that a lot of people. So the way that the qualifications worked is there were there were uh, arena tournaments that Star City held, and uh, if you achieved a certain record in that arena qualifier, you get to qualify for the Invitational. So there might be a lot of people who are qualified and maybe going to the Invitational that might not play as much modern as they do standard. And I think for a lot of those players, Burn is going to be a deck that they definitely look towards because it's cheap, it's efficient, it's I think it's quite good right now. I think it's one of the better decks in the format. And it's just something that people can sort of pick up and play without having too many reps. Um, so that is uh, something that I think may be the most represented deck. Again, I think the 10% might be a bit of a stretch, maybe looking more towards in the like 7% range. But I think Burn will probably be the most represented deck. And deck number two on my list is going to be Hammer Time. Now, Hammer Time is one of the best performing decks on Magic Online, and it is one of the most powerful decks in the format. And on top of all of that, it's, you know, relatively inexpensive outside of the, you know, Stoneforge, Myst Stoneforge Mystic Urza Sagas. Uh, but Stoneforge Mystics, maybe people already had those previously in their collections from iter other iterations of Modern. You know, if they've played Paper Magic in the past, maybe they already have Stoneforges. The one thing I will say about Hammer Time, and something that I've kind of learned over the past couple of weeks of playing against it, I played a league or two with it. I watched other people stream it. It is one of the hardest decks in the format to play, and something that I didn't really think, I didn't really grasp how difficult it was to play at first. But there's just a ton of sequencing decisions where if you play the wrong spell before, like if you play a hammer before a paladin or vice versa, like there's just so many different sequencing decisions that you can mess up. And even the smallest decision can be the difference between winning and losing. Just the, the creature you play on turn one, three turns down the road, you can lose the game because you play the wrong creature on turn one. So Hammer Time is a deck that has a very high skill gap because it, it requires a lot of reps. Um, again, it's one of, similar to Burn, it is one of those decks where it's a little forgiving in the sense of if you have Sigarda's Aid plus Hammer plus turn one creature, sometimes you're just going to do the thing and your opponent, you know, like what, depending on what your opponent's playing, 
maybe they don't have any, you know, instant speed interaction and you just kind of get them pretty good. But those games, as people really adapt and have adapted over the past couple of weeks to the Hammer Time deck, those free wins just aren't coming anymore because people are prepared with Solitudes and, you know, one meter removal spells and Force of Negations and all, all these free spells that people are playing. You're not getting those free wins as much. So you really have to squeeze out the wins and all the value. Um, and with that comes, you know, proper sequencing and playing correctly. So I think this will be one of the more represented decks, probably similar to about where Burn is, maybe a little bit below Burn, but they're going to be pretty close. Um, but it's one of those things where, you know, similar to Burn again, the power level is there and it's pretty f fairly forgiving and um, definitely does require, does not require, but it... Uh, rewards a ton of repetition. So I think that'll be the second most played deck. Coming in at number three, we have the Rhinos deck. Now I'm grouping the Rhinos deck with Teamer in four color because I, I've talked to a few people that are going that have that are told me that they're playing the four color version. Um, personally, I think the four color version is a little bit better right now, but I can definitely see arguments for playing Teamer if you're a little bit worried about the extra 20 cards, if you're worried about the extra color causing you, you know, a little bit of harm in terms of your mana base and your deck's less consistent at 20 cards more. I get it. I get all of the uh, arguments against playing 80 cards. So I'm kind of grouping the 80 and the 60 card versions together as just Crash Gade. But, you know, just in terms of its... I think the Rhinos deck is really underappreciated. I think... Um, I've been hearing some things recently of people who maybe just don't respect how how aggressive and how consistent this deck is in terms of like, you know, it might not seem to a lot of people that two four fours on turn three is necessarily the most uh, the the best start that you could have in the modern format, and I, I get that. But what, what the Rhinos deck does is it gets to back that up with all the free interaction. You get to play Fury, you get to play Force of Negation, you get to play cheap spells. Fire Ice is one of the best cards in the deck because it just gets to tap your opponent's land in an effective time walk. So it's it's not just the Rhinos themselves because if you do nothing, nothing and play Rhinos and then have nothing else, people can usually beat that. I get that. But when you're backing it up with the free interaction and time walk on turn two and all this stuff. Um, but overall, I think the Rhinos deck is one of the better decks in the format. Um... I think people might gravitate more towards Hammer Time and Burn, especially the people who have qualified from via the standard, uh, the standard qualifiers on Arena. They might not, they might not want to gravitate towards this deck. It also is a little bit more pricey. I don't know how much you want to factor that in, but it's one of the more powerful decks. Would I be surprised if it, more people played it than Hammer or Burn? Not necessarily, but I do think people will gravitate towards this less. Um, but again, I'm grouping this and the four color version together, even though I think the four color version would be my preferred choice. If I was attending, I would be playing the four color Rhinos deck. Um, but Rhinos is just definitely a proven strategy within the format. Very hard to hate out too, because you can you can load up on chalices and void mirrors, but then you just lose to the the Fury season pyromancer or that kind of stuff. So uh, I think this will be the third most played deck at SCGCon. All right, and coming in at number four is going to be the four-color canister Yorion Blink Pile, I guess is what we'll call it. That's kind of a long name. Maybe we should try to shorten that a little bit. But this is a deck that uh, has been really crushing the modern leagues over the past week or so. Uh, it's been doing very well in leagues. It put a ton of results over the weekend in the challenges and the PTQ and all this stuff. Um, the one thing I think holding this deck back is the price tag. It is far and away the most expensive deck in the format. You know, Solitude, Fury, Omnath, Ren and Six, Teferi, Fetchlands. Uh, it's just, it's a lot. There's a lot. So I think that might have a, that might have a factor into whether or not people decide to play this deck. I do think it is, if you're playing like a mid-range deck, like a pure mid-range deck, I think this is probably the, the best thing that you could be doing. But again, the price tag is a little hefty, and it is a pretty intricate deck in terms of the play patterns, uh, like when to utilize your free spells, you know, when to you know when to kind of kind of play uh, to play a planeswalker, how to use your planeswalkers, how do you want to use your expressive iterations. There's a lot of decisions to be made with this deck, you know, when do I go for ephemerate that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of decisions to be made with this deck. So, you know, kind of like Hammer Time, it is one of the less forgiving decks in terms, or uh, one of the harder decks to play. Unlike Hammer Time, it doesn't have those busted draws. You really got to work for your wins with this deck sometimes. 
Granted, sometimes you, you know, you can just, you know, Fury plus Blink your Fury and your opponent has no board and you have a 3-3, double strike, and that happens sometimes, but against people who maybe Fury is not quite as good, uh, like the control matchup, I, I can't even, the control matchup, control matchup must be a nightmare, not in terms of, like, actually being a bad matchup, but just how to sequence your spells, I can't, I can't imagine playing that matchup, that's, that must be a, a, a you know, a real pain. Um, in terms of playing out the games. But I do think this deck will be moderately represented. I, I do think that if price were not an issue, maybe it would be a little bit higher in terms of the metagame share. But it is one of the best decks, had a great showing last weekend, and I would not be surprised if people did show up with it. All right, this might be, this is probably going to be my bold prediction, but I think Tron is actually going to be the fifth most played deck at the SCG Con. Now, you'll remember if you watched the metagame recap that we did Saturday, or excuse me, Sunday slash Monday, I did peg Tron as a deck that I thought was going to increase in popularity this weekend due to the rise in the four color decks. Um, I, I'm i still not sure how the matchup exactly plays out. Like, the four color deck does have spreading seas, but at the same time, they don't really have a reasonable clock, and they kind of just give the Tron deck as much time as they need to just get to seven or eight lands and start casting big things. So I think Tron is pretty well positioned against that particular deck list, uh, or yeah, against that particular four color deck. And I do think that you can maybe, like you can have additional sideboard cards to be able to beat Burn. The Hammer Time matchup is a little more suspect. I've seen Tron, you know, incorporating Force of Vigor, but if, if you look at the Tron decks, they don't have a ton of green cards, so they're not always reliably casting Force of Vigor on turn one or turn two when they need to be casting it in that matchup. So I think your Hammer Time matchup is probably still going to be not the greatest, but I think you can make your burn matchup decent. I think the deck is okay against Rhinos. Um, you know, Force of, like, threat, uh, turn three Rhinos backed up by Force of Negation can be tough sometimes. But you know you do have some some good cards. You have you have warping whale to counter uh, to counter crashing footfalls. But I think Tron is is poised for a comeback, and I would not be surprised if a decent number of people played it. Also, it's one of the decks that it's one of those things where if people have a modern deck and people you know it, it's like people just play their pet deck, and a lot of people's pet deck is Tron. And if you've had Tron cards for the past seven or eight years, you're probably still just going to keep playing Tron. So that's one of those things as well. Uh, obviously, you know, fairly easy to play and definitely a uh, punishing deck in a metagame that is infested with a bunch of Yorions and four color money piles. So I think Tron is poised to have a comeback. I would not be surprised to see a copy in the top eight. Um, now, granted, the top eight is the top eight is standard, but, you know, in terms of getting you to those rounds, I would not be surprised if a Tron player did well in the modern portion of the event. All right, I'm just going to round out a couple of uh, a couple of last ones because I know the video is getting a little bit long. So Merktad Region is the next deck. Uh, it is a deck that a lot of people play online. It's uh, a deck that people gravitate towards, like these blue blaze blue based tempo strategies, a lot of cantrips, cheap threat stuff like that. Uh, would not be surprised if a lot of people or if if the deck did show up in a reasonable fashion. But it is again one of those decks where it's. It's, I'm not going to say it's the hardest deck to play, but there's a lot of sequencing decisions again, um, it, especially in matchups where you are, like your removal maybe, maybe isn't as good, like against the Rhinos deck, for example. I played a lot of matchups from the Rhino side where sequencing matters a ton, so the deck isn't the easiest to play, and, um, you know, so th that might be a thing, but there are a lot of people who love playing cheap threats, counter spells, so definitely a deck that I expect to see in moderate numbers. All right, and the last deck that I'm going to go over today is actually the deck that won the last Modern Challenge this past weekend, and that is Living End. Now, there's a lot of arguments that you could make for Living End over Rhinos in terms of the Cascade deck. Here's the issue. With Living End winning the Modern Challenge and people being maybe a little bit more prepared for it, um, I feel like people might be scared off of playing it given how well it did, you know. Um, it's one of those things where, like, a graveyard deck wins a challenge, and then the next week the people have more graveyard hate in their sideboard. So, on top of the fact that people are already hating on Rhinos with Void Mirror and Chalice of the Void, which you get splash hate for here, you're also losing to the people who are hating on Reanimator if they're bringing Leyline of the Voids and those kinds of cards to the mix. So, you get a lot of splash hate, and... I, I, I guess I agree the deck maybe is a little bit more powerful in its you know highest percentile of draws but it's also losing to a lot more sideboard cards so I think that might scare people away from playing it this weekend 
it is a very powerful deck, and if you're, you know, as long as you're, if you're into the Cascade stuff, you could do no wrong by playing Living End, but you have to be a little bit weary of those sideboard cards. So that's why I think maybe less people will be uh, interested in playing it, and uh, that's why I think maybe it'll only be uh, a little bit lower in terms of metagame share. All right, and that is going to conclude our SCG Con metagame predictions. As far as I'm aware, unfortunately, there is no live coverage of the event. However, we will be going over the results, and I'll even do a little bit of a metagame breakdown when we do the metagame recap on Monday. So stay tuned for that. That should be good. Um, but yeah, that is going to do it from here. We'll uh, hopefully see what I got right, maybe what I didn't get right. Maybe I made some bold predictions. But in any case, if you made it all the way to the end of the video, please be sure to hit the like and subscribe button. Let me know in the comment section below what you thought of the video. And I will see you guys in the next one.